tips for dealing with the bags. So perhaps you're renting in a property where it is run by a body corporate. Understanding the basic calculation, income minus expenses, and you want to be left with a positive income. It is a very tough game, not easy at all. To stay ahead of um, knowing exactly what what your clients need, what, what their teething issues are. Have a joint move-in inspection. But a lot of people that are coming into sectional title, homeowners associations are just like you described, first, not only first time homeowners, but first time owners and residents in community schemes. They get to see the perspective from the other side of the aisle. And I think that's a really important thing to do. It's a market that's estimated to, to, to be transacting at least 9 billion rent per year. So it's a huge market. In order to get there, you need to be able to build up a track record. Your cash flow module needs to be sharp. Um, a, a quote comes to mind. The best time to buy a property was about 10 years ago. The next best time is now. Good evening and welcome to episode 93 of the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Uzamando Kumalo. It's a Tuesday edition of the show. We are counting down to episode 100. I know I keep saying this, I mean, I certainly said it when we were reaching episode 50. I cannot believe that when we started this, it was in March, we're going into lockdown. We're looking at different tips to navigate your property journey, if you're a tenant or if you're a landlord, and being able to communicate together. And here we are counting down to episode 100 well it certainly wouldn't have happened without of course you at home who kept watching and asking for more topics for us to explore so as we come down to episode 100 i want to hear what more or what kind of content do you want to see more of in the coming weeks we are going uh we are rather uh, you know making sure that we plan episode 100 and you're certainly in store for a surprise for episode 100 so do keep staying tuned to find out what we have in store for you for episode 100 and of course one of the things that we have in store for you is this book here and i'm sure a few of you have seen me talking about it and this is of course the private property um you know book that is the ultimate guide to property and this ultimate guide covers essential topics on first time buying selling renting and investing and it is a must read for everyone who wants to be uh you know going to property who's interested in property i'm sure you probably didn't see that one properly so there you go and of course if you want to find out more information or where to find the property guide then do go to the property guide.co.za the book is currently available for 150 rands it is for a limited offer so do make sure that you grab your hands on this particular book it has a lot of useful tips if you're a first-time buyer if you're a seasoned investor and there are different things and certain different aspects of property that you want to get a better sense of and of course one of the things that we want to get a better sense of when it comes to property this evening is around energy efficiency. We're going to be looking at the things every property investor must know about geysers and energy efficiency. I'm sure a lot of us have this one as you know a sore point. Uh, sometimes even in our own primary homes where your bill comes back and you're thinking, how is this so high? A lot of property investors know to rather just install prepaid meters, but then your tenants complain that you know their electricity is just finishing too quickly. So we're certainly going to be exploring energy efficiencies and giving you tips and tools to navigate your energy efficiency needs, not just in your primary residence, but particularly for property investors. And to help us better understand how we can be more energy efficient, I'm joined this evening by Glenn for the favor, who is an agent at Max Light. Glenn, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Zama, thank you for, for having uh, giving us the opportunity and thank you to all of your viewers. Uh, it's great to have this platform to discuss with people. Look, Glenn, I think let's probably start with um, some useful insights around what we need to know about being as energy efficient as possible in our homes, especially as property investors. Because I think a lot of us, when we're looking at different units, we always talk about the importance of obviously doing your research. You go onto privateproperty.co.za, you buy yourself a copy of the property guide, and there are all these different, you know, useful hints and tips that you can use to navigate uh, making the right investment decision. 
But more often than not, we don't think about the energy aspect of it, right? And this is, of course, a cost that will pass down to the tenant. And we don't think about the effects that that could have on our tenant if we don't um, understand what goes into being as energy efficient and even perhaps choosing uh, you know, apartments in complexes or estates or buildings that are as energy efficient as possible. Perhaps give us some insights on what we need to know about being as energy efficient as possible in the properties that we either build or buy into. Um, yeah, I mean, in other parts of the world, you actually buy a house uh, today or you buy an apartment and you get an energy rating um, that, that outlines it as well. We don't have such a thing in South Africa at the moment. Um, but we do have a, a, a drive towards more efficiency. Um, recently, over the, over the last few years, the, our geezers have had to conform to a, a higher standard in terms of B ratings. Um, we've seen the reintroduction of solar geezers uh, since sort of 2008. So, so, you know, you don't have to drive around or go far to see the introduction of solar panels into complexes. Um, all of these things play play a part in terms of making your house more efficient. Um, unfortunately, most of these things come with a cost and that's, I think, probably the most frightening thing for people. Um, today, I would, uh, you know, I would start by saying to anybody, step one, sort your geezer out. Make sure your geezer is the most efficient that you could possibly possibly have. And, and, and the starting point would be solar geezers. You know, if you were looking at buying a property, does the property have solar geezers? Is the volume of, of, of water available from the solar geyser adequate for, for our usage as a family in this house or for a person in this house? And look at, look at the little things. It, it, a gas stove, it doesn't consume as much electricity as a, as a geyser does, but, but a gas stove plays a part. Um, and, and, and find out, look at the little things in terms of energy efficiency, the LED lights or the LED lights running around, or is it just incandescent? Um, take note of those things that you play a role at the bottom, at, at the end of the day, on the bottom line of the electrical board. And, and, and you know, you, you mentioned the Giza, and I'm sure so many of us have have had issues with geezers. And before we probably even get to, you know, some of the, the issues that we essentially have, how do we then go about to, you know, in ensuring that the geezer is energy efficient? Because I'm sure a lot of us, myself included, I'm a property investor, I've been at it for a couple of years, and a geezer isn't one of the things I would even think about when I look at a property, even in my own primary residence, it's not something I typically think about. Uh, I mean, I know I used to have, you know, certain geezer behavior. So there were times when I switch it off and on. And I think a part of me just ended up getting over it because if I forget to switch it on, then the following day I'm, I'm having a lukewarm shower. So at some point I thought, you know what, it actually doesn't make much of a difference. It's fine, I'll pay the extra 100 or 200 rands, but the reality is we've certainly seen, you know, different innovations that solve for that so that you don't have to remind yourself to switch it on and off. But how do we go about ensuring that the geezers that we essentially get are energy efficient? Because we don't know a lot about them. I mean, if the geezer bursts, we get a new one, the body corporate will say X, Y, Z must be done. But we don't really know what goes into um, ensuring that the geezer itself is energy efficient. It's very difficult at the, at the outset. I mean, unless you're prepared to climb into the roof and, and, and dig through the roof space and sort of look at the geyser or, or, you know, perhaps it's a solar geyser on the roof and then you, you could look at it and try and do some investigation around that. But it's very difficult at the outset to, to establish how energy efficient your geyser is. Um, you would always like to see some sort of alternative heating source. Um, you, you know, um, the Eskom rebate, uh, specifically targeted solar geysers because of the fact that that they give you a hell of a savings on on electricity they save you a lot of money if, if you install the right type of geyser with the right uh, sizing um, for the usage in the house you can save a lot of money on that um, today we see more and more uh, commonly these a, a pv driven solution that that can heat up a geyser um, so yeah, it's very difficult at the outset to identify and be able to say how efficient the geyser is or isn't. One of the things that we are seeing is that banks uh, and financiers, um, when, when people are buying houses, are very receptive to a homeowner saying, look, I want to install 
you know, two solar geysers or some PV panels, and they're allowing them to extend their bonds um, or increase the bonds, include those those items onto the bond, so that um, that they benefit from from the energy savings in it. Which certainly at the outset is is, is quite a nice idea. Um, you know, if you were buying it at the outset to, to add those solar geysers or or PV panels onto the roof would be a fantastic idea. And and, and I mean, Glenn, what would you say? probably besides the cost factor would be the reason why it's so important for us to either find out if the geysers we're using are as energy efficient as possible or for us to get them there. I mean, I'm, I'm probably thinking a lot of property investors might think, well, okay, I know that geysers can be, uh, or the cost that geysers sort of um, cost in terms of electricity might be relatively high, but it's not in the thousands, for example. So perhaps some of them might think maybe it's not that important to, making sure that you know you're energy efficient in that department what would you say is part of the reason why it's important for us to still be able to go down that route and explore perhaps different alternatives look i mean if, if we were able to eliminate all the geysers in the country and and put solar geysers in we'd be looking at a far more stable grid you know it's not realistic to to just say be doing that but you know, the, the more the more house home energy efficient, obviously the bigger the less the spend would be for the homeowner in terms of electricity. I think the biggest the biggest uh, driving force today is to bring your running costs down. And if you yeah. can bring running costs down on a property, if you're an investor and you're able to to rent a property to 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 a tenant, and they only paying 250 300 rand on 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 electricity. You know, you're probably going to struggle to get that tenant out because he's going to love paying those running costs. Um, you know, that's next to nothing in comparison to what he could be paying elsewhere. Um, so yeah, bringing your running costs down certainly makes sense to any investor and, and any homeowner as well. You know, typically geysers or, or energy efficient geysers, solar geysers, they have a return of, of you know three years. That's sort of the target. And a solar geyser, you would want to get to a space where you can pour. You know, eight to nine months, ten months of the year, turn it off so that the sun can can do the work. And if you can't get to that point, uh, you don't necessarily have have a solar geyser that's doing what you want it to do. Um, and, and that is very important. And and you you've actually already started speaking on this, Glenn. You know, what would you say are some of the alternatives then to traditional geysers? Because I I know you buy into a place. Uh, we typically just know the standard, you know, geezer. But what are some of the alternatives? I mean, I've seen different people bring on these great innovations where sometimes I think there's like a thing they place close to the tap, so you don't actually need the geezer when you open the water. The water's kind of automatically uh, hot. So there, we're already seeing different kinds of ways that or innovations that people are bringing into the market to solve for needing this big thing that sits, whether it's on top of your roof or by the kitchen, wherever it is that your geezer is, and pretty much like consumes a lot of energy and trying to find different alternative ways that are not as energy um, inefficient. So what would you say then are some of the alternatives to traditional geezers? So you do get um, a number of instantaneous heaters and, and those sorts of um, smaller boilers that can fit next to a kitchen or instant, an instantaneous heater, as I've just mentioned. The problem with those things is they're not overly efficient. Yes, you get away from what you call the standing losses, but what it means is that the water that's running through the tap has a second or two to get to the temperature that it's set at. It has to glow red in order to deliver hot water uh, to the point of use, and, and it is situated at the point of use, which which means it incurs a lot of energy consumption to heat that water and deliver hot water right at that point. If you've got geysers, um, solar geysers, for example, or, 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 or a, a B rate that the geyser with slightly more efficiency, um, your your you heat to the volume of water once, and you you eliminate a lot of the standing losses. You do you do incur some losses in terms of moving the water from the geyser to the point of usage. Um, unfortunately, today, the realistic side is that water is cheaper than electricity. So if you were to pick one to have to, to lose or sacrifice, you're probably better off sacrificing water in terms of uh, cost because the electricity costs a lot more to heat that water. So yeah, solar geysers um, or the bigger tanks um, where they heat up a larger volume is, is 
better because of the standing losses. Um, gas heaters, for example, 100% uh, electrical savings on a gas heater, but 100% transfer of cost from gas, from electricity to gas. Uh, gas is not cheap when you have to heat water. Um, and you have to heat it at a flow rate, and that's where it becomes expensive. And, and you know, I think when I think about gas, I also just think about how, if you're certainly like myself, I, I sometimes, um, I'm always wary when I, I live in a place that has gas. And as much as I know there are all these safety checks that are there uh, and they're there for a reason, but even when I think of a gas stove, there's always a part of me that just thinks, oh my goodness, I'm in a house uh, or in a property that actually has gas. I'm always uh, on slight alert. Uh, because I know that there's gas in the house. So there's a part of me that doesn't quite want to live in a place that has gas, especially on a daily basis. I think if it's one of those things where perhaps you've gone for a weekend away and you know there's a gas, there are gas appliances, I'm okay with it. But the, the thought of living in a place with gas, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I will admit it, it makes me uh, slightly uneasy. Okay, we're gonna go for a quick break. In order to come back, I want us to look at some of the, you know, the differences in the types of geysers that we, you know, we typically find, whether in our states uh, or perhaps even in standalone houses, and perhaps what states can do to better manage. Uh, energy in the various estates because we're seeing that there are a lot of estates that are being built uh, some of them don't have prepaid meters they, they typically will come with uh, you know the build system your electricity bill especially in those winter periods sometimes it's quite high sometimes I think some of us think look this electricity bill is just consistently high so we're really trying to explore what are the different things that estates in particular can do to minimize uh, energy and make sure that we essentially spend less on our energy needs as possible to our viewers at home I want to hear from you know what hacks uh, have you started using when it comes to making sure that you're as energy efficient as possible. Now I shared earlier that I used to switch my geezer off and on and off and on. Then I'd forget and then the next thing I, I like left literally with lukewarm five to cold water, which isn't particularly great if you're having to start your day very early. So do share with us what your energy efficiency hacks are, especially if you used to find that your bill was quite high and now you're able to manage to get your bill low because there was something that you changed in the way that you're running your either primary residence or your investment properties. We want to hear from you. We're gonna go for a quick break and we'll be back just after this. Welcome back to episode 93 of the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Uzamantunga Kumalo. This evening, we're talking about energy and energy efficiency. So these are some of the things that every property investor needs to know when it comes to energy efficiency, especially when it comes to geezers. I'm sure a lot of us, you know, having gone through winter and winter and the times of COVID, we thought we were not going to have blackouts and then we had blackouts. So understanding energy efficiency as much as possible is one of those things that are quite important. And I think as property investors, it's also one of those things you want to, you know, keep at a minimum because it does make your property more attractive to people who are going to live there for your ability to be able to say, look, my place is energy efficient in X, Y, Z way. And these are the typical costs that you're looking into uh, when it comes to, for example, the electricity cost when you live in my apartment is definitely a value proposition, especially in areas where we're seeing a lot of stock on the market and a lot of tenants have, you know, a lot of choice in terms of which properties they can choose. Now to better help us understand how to be better energy efficient and to make the right decisions when it comes to which geezers we ought to be um, going from during this evening by Glenn van der Favor, who is an agent at Max Light. Now, Glenn, before the break, I did say that I wanted to look at then the differences between geezers in the States and, you know, your freehold houses, because I think a lot of the times these estates get built and, you know, geezers get installed. I think sometimes the area where the geezers get installed is not the most efficient. 
um, and just doesn't make sense, especially when you see geezers bursting and then different units get affected. It's, it's just drama, right? So perhaps take us through the difference between those types of geezer, the geezers that we see in those particular um, instances. Yes, I'm a, the, the, the freestanding house is quite a simple one. You would go to a guy's house or you know, somebody could come and they, it's one guy making a decision on where best suits him and what type of geezer best suits him. Um, when his geezer bursts, he contacts his insurance and his insurance sends a team out and he may already be thinking along the lines of going to a solar geezer or a different type of geezer and he may arrange something with his, with his insurer and you know, there's a cash payout and he's able to put in a solar geezer, for example. Uh, in a complex, it becomes a little bit more tricky because there's a whole set of rules and regulations that, that homeowners are supposed to live towards. And uh, in many complexes these days, I see that I walk around and we, I look at geezers and I think these people are never going to be able to save any money on these geezers. Um, they're never going to be able to put an alternative heating source on it. They're never going to find a way to it unless the complex as, as a whole comes together and says, you know, we're going to consolidate our, our, our thinking here and choose a particular brand or choose a particular style of heating and really work together as a whole rather than just saying, well, you know, your geezer's failed, just replace your geezer. Uh, one's actually got to, the complex as a whole has got to sit down with trustees and say, what are the possibilities? How can we do this? And then either offer that to the, 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 the homeowners or put something into place where, where they pay for it or finance it is, is, probably, um, is probably one of the better ways. You know, a, a complex that's suitable for solar geezers, for example, could contact financiers, work, working closely with brokers, the, the insurance broker, and uh, try and put together a solution to, to uh, put solar geezers onto a complex. Um, so it's far more complicated in the complex than what it is in the homeowners on a standalone house. And, and then, Glenn, you know, you're already saying that when you walk around in some of these complexes, you're already able to identify how saving energy uh, or certainly making sure that owners don't pay as much is going to be very difficult, probably given the placement of the geezers. What, do you, what would you then say, you know, developers need to do better? We're still seeing a lot of projects that are already up. We're seeing projects that are already being built. What can developers then do better, uh, especially when it comes to this particular issue? I, I, th I think the biggest issue that, that a lot of complexes have is, is, is your claims ratio. And the claims ratio starts to, to creep in when you're sort of putting in tanks uh, based purely on price and not so much of quality or longevity of your tanks. And, you know, obviously a better quality or, or tank would come with a slightly bigger price tag, but certainly putting in a tank that could last you 10 years plus. We used to make tanks years ago. Everybody says things, look, the way things used to be done in the past was so much better. We have tanks that can last those sorts of durations. It's a case of the developers putting in a tank that can last, that can go the distance, rather than putting in a cheaper tank. And then you sit in a complex where uh, you've got a claims ratio where geezers are failing you know, day in and day out. And that just chases the premiums of the insurance up. Um, again, consolidate, bring your geezers. If you're staying in a complex, the trustees should, to some extent, consolidate work very closely with the insurance brokers and, uh, and, try and, and try and get a better solution for the complex. Um, developers, better quality tanks with, with, longer long, with longevity in them. You know, you know, Glenn, we were talking about this uh, before the show started off, offline and I, I, one of the questions I asked you was, you know, why are geezers not lasting that long? Because I, I, I think of, uh, you know, in my primary residence, I think this geezer burst, I think it was last year sometime. Uh, thankfully, nothing has happened so far. And it caught me off surprise. I hadn't been staying here that particularly long. And luckily, body corporate insurance claim and, 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 and a part of me thinks this happens so often because then I see the maintenance guys bringing in different geezers for different units. A geezer is something that we're using on a daily basis. So why is it that it's not built for the long term? It's not as though it's you know one of those appliances or uh, fixtures in a property that you use every other day or every other week. It's a daily thing. Almost without a doubt, every household does use it every day. So what's so difficult about 
you know, finding ones or buying ones that are built to last longer or them almost as a standard being built to last longer? Zama, it, that's, that's ultimately a, a, an awesome point because you do have it. There are these tanks. The reason that you don't get to this is because when the tank fails, all you're doing is concerned and freaking out, making sure that you've got hot water for tonight and tomorrow morning. Um, and really, um, there, are, there are brokers out there. I mean, I can name uh, certainly Adshow. Uh, they are actively looking at, at solutions for their, their complexes and for their, their tenants and homeowners so that when this thing does happen, this has already been thought of. This, this box has already been ticked. As you, as you rightly say, people use it every day. It's the biggest consumer of energy in people's houses. You know, if, if instead of just sort of milling around the house, consider the options. Look at your tank and, and know that at one point this tank is going to fail. It might have been there for 50 years or 40 years in, in, in the case of many of the older geezers. But the tanks today, we're not seeing those sorts of lifespans out of them. Um, you know, if you get to five or six years, um, it's a lot. Why is it getting to that? It's all it's all driven by price. It's all driven by price and this competition to buy the or to, to monopolize based on price. And if it's the cheapest, everybody will be buying it. Nobody's taking a step back and saying, well, is it going to last us the longest? Um, and unfortunately, a lot of that is tied into our insurance, especially on the bigger complexes where you've got this... Uh, this uh, reluctance to 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 tie yourself in with an insurer and and say right guys you know we back you uh, and and we want the best quality for us you know for what for our complex and that's where your broker comes in and, and can certainly do a lot for you there and and I think you know one of the things that when you speak about insurance companies that I I, I think about or even when you talk about price is of course the risk right perhaps take us through what some of the potential, um, I'll say the, the risk that perhaps the, the complexes and particularly the complexes, you know, run into when it comes to, you know, geezers and being energy efficient, because I think a lot of them, we've, cert we've seen certain developers not put in too much attention to detail when, you know, building their various complexes and estates. We've seen certain developers sort of cut corners quite, quite a lot. And, you know, people who end up staying there complain quite significantly, but perhaps take us through some of the risks specifically um, that we find when it comes to geysers and energy efficiency in complexes. Yeah, as you said, the, the developer not giving it enough thought is a, probably the biggest risk because when that geezer does start failing or does typically, the term burst is, is, is incorrect. You know, if a geezer bursts, part of the building is now missing. Um, it, it is ultimately a, a pressure vessel and it can potentially explode. Um, so, so you don't think of it as, as being having burst, it's failed. And when it starts to fail, uh, sometimes it drips on the geyser below it. Sometimes they put the electrical connections down the bottom and you burn the isolators out. Uh, you don't have access to the geysers to make those changes and those replacements on those geysers. So your cost to replace it becomes a problem. There are many, there are many manufacturers that arrive at a site and say, well, you know, here's your tank and, and it's got to go three floors up. There's no steps. There's no platform on which to work. Uh, there's none of those things. So unless you're working closely with a, with an you know a, 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 an incident management centre that's well equipped for that sort of high lifting or high replacements, uh, you're going to be facing a bill where there's going to be, need to be scaffolding and a whole bunch of extra things that, that actually have got nothing to do with replacing the geezer. Um, and in often in, in many cases that's just passed on to the homeowners being. You know, your limit is 7,000 Rand and actually this replacement is 12,000 Rand and the homeowner has got to put that bill at the end of the day because the insurance won't pay for access. They'll pay for the replacement, but not access. Um, so yeah, the biggest, the biggest risks are putting them in positions where you actually can't access them and you can't replace them and they're not, they're not easily to work with. Um, even if it's just element and, and thermostat or vacuum breakers that need to be replaced. If it's not accessible and it's not easy to work on, it's going to cost. 
We are taking comments and questions from our viewers at home. And we've got one here mm -hmm. from uh, Mullah Rafiq Kamal, who asks, uh, switching it on and off, do you think it's safe? Yes, certainly. Um, it, it, it is safe. I would say that um, if you were going to switch it on and off, install an electrical timer. You get a digital timer that's got a battery in it that lasts for a number of days if the power does go out so you don't lose your settings. Put that into your electrical board and uh, allow the timer to control switching it on and off during the course of a 24 hours period. That way you don't have to have the lukewarm showers if you don't wake up in time or you don't get to it to turn it on or something along those lines. Yeah. No, I think that's certainly one of the things that uh, is that uh, that I saw in the market that I thought, look, this is probably a thing that I, I need instead of having to manually do it myself. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, Ben, before I let you go, any final tips that you'd like to share with our viewers at home when it comes to particularly geysers and being as energy efficient as possible? Um, you can turn the geysers on and off and get those get those super you know get rid of the standing losses of the geyser which certainly does save you a chunk of change but i would i would start by researching geysers looking at tanks certainly with 10-year warranty um, you would want a tank that's perhaps stainless steel or is able to last the life last, last many years um, and start being proactive about your geyser. You use it, as you rightly said, all the time. It consumes the most amount of electricity. Be in a position that when your geyser does fail, you've thought about it, you've got some form of a plan in mind, so to speak. And if you're in a complex, start talking to the complex. Um, get in touch with, with, with insurance brokers that are proactive about this. So there's a plan in place. There's a plan in place on how to mitigate that when that tank fails, step one is this, step two is that, so that you, you're well positioned for it. Because the risk of having no hot water on the coldest winter's day, everybody hates it. Glenn, we're going to leave it there this evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, and to, so we're going to wrap it up slightly differently this evening. We've got a comment here from Michael Anderson, who said, I consider Glenn to be South Africa's foremost geezer expert. He has helped many of my clients. And that's, of course, a big thumbs up for uh, Glenn, uh, Glenn, Glenn Van Favor. So if you want to get in touch with him, we have shared his contact details down here below. Perhaps you have uh, certain geezer needs or want his expertise, uh, whether for a complex or a state that you are living in. Well, folks, we're going to leave it there this evening on the Private Property Podcast. It has been a pleasure to be with you. Uh, we're back again, of course, tomorrow evening. We'll be speaking uh, to APSA and we've got something very interesting in store for you. And of course, as usual, hoping that you're staying home and staying safe. We'll see you again tomorrow evening. Bye-bye. Hi, I'm Nicolene Terlach and I'm part of the SA Women's Hockey team and I'm the technical director of Tux Hockey and I'm also the assistant coach for the first team leads. I moved to Ferry Glen about five years ago. Ferry Glen is a really safe place and the people are really kind. Some of my friends live really close by in suburbs like Equestria and Olympus. In the morning I will wake up, make myself a cup of coffee, go for a jog in the Fairy Glen Nature Reserve or even just in the neighborhood. It's safe, quiet, and the environment is really nice. I love Ferry Glen because I'm near the city, but I'm not in the city. I like to go to Pretoria Country Club to clear my mind I'm on my own to relax and just to enjoy a round of golf. In Pretoria East we really have nice uh, places to visit like Menland Mall and Brooklyn Mall, it is really close by. 
There are also a lot of top schools in the area, like Pretoria Borsa and Yoshkun in the park. One of the most beautiful places to see the whole of Pretoria is the Fort Kapperkop viewpoint. And that's my neighborhood.